afternoon, Your Worship and Councillors. Uh, living with COVID is perhaps the biggest challenge currently facing New Zealand. So far, COVID has cancelled our travel plans, put many of us in work from home mode, restricted who and where we can meet, and curtailed our business activities. Basically, COVID has changed our lives. Living with COVID will be part of our future in the Waipa. After the first lockdown, the Waipa economy bounced back strongly, largely on the back of the primary sector. However, the pain of the pandemic is not even yet once you get below the headline numbers. The visitor industry, aviation, retail, hospitality, accommodation have all been badly affected. Consumer values and purchasing patterns have changed since the pandemic. While local businesses have embraced online ordering and deliver deliveries, click and collect, many will still suffer from supply chain is issues in the slow, anxious crawl to Christmas. Some consumers may have, been, may have permanently changed their behaviour. I'd like to introduce Chris Wilkinson from First Retail and Lorraine, who's going to talk about the effect of COVID on consumer-facing businesses, particularly our CBDs. Chris will discuss initiatives and issues, sharing what has worked well across New Zealand and overseas. Uh, his presentation links to other council work streams like our COVID recovery pro program, economic wellbeing strategy, the community spatial plan, town concept plans, and various other initiatives in play. First retail last presented to Cambridge retailers in 2019, but this time I thought it was useful for the insights to be shared with elected members and staff. And as a thought starter, given the other streams, work streams in play. First Retail Group are experts in developing potential, driving performance and managing risk in consumer facing sectors, including retail, hospitality, healthcare, and tourism. So now I would like to introduce you to Chris Wilkinson, Managing Director of First Retail based out of Wellington. Chris will share his screen and take you through his presentation. And we have an opportunity for Q&A at the end of this presentation. Chris, over to you. Hi, Steve, and uh, hi, our friends up in the, in the Waikato. Um, we're very proud to be here today, I guess, on this auspicious day on the eve of the reopening. Um, and I also want to congratulate uh, yourselves on this initiative and in getting some shared understanding of what's going on out there uh, both in the economy, but also in our town centres. Um, as Steve's mentioned, we've worked uh, closely with Waipa District Council over a number of years, and we've stayed very close to, to, to what's going on there. We've also worked for Hamilton City Council in the past as well. Uh, Steve's mentioned that we work extensively around town and city centres. So yes, we, we, we've um, delivered projects for pretty much most of the progressive councils from Auckland down to Invercargill. Uh, we've delivered projects around the world, including the UK and Singapore. At the moment, we're proudly uh, part of the Expo 2020, which is happening in Dubai. Uh, it's a New Zealand government initiative. We've worked for the Australian governments in places like Phillip Island. Uh, we've got, uh, we're working with clients in Fiji right now, and Fiji's opened back up to international markets this week delivering projects around uh, town and city centres that are evolving. Uh, this week we're in Whanganui uh, in the next couple of days. Um, and we've also got projects happening right now across the Wellington area, which we're based around transport uh, changes. So movements to mass transit and uh, cycle and um, uh, better walking and um, active, mobile, active transport modes. So as these mentioned, um, in our, in our relationship with YPA started back in 2017, where we ran a number of workshops for businesses uh, and property owners in Te Awamutu. Um, that gave us a, a huge insight into the dynamics of, uh, of the Waikato. We've just come out of working for 
Hamilton City Council on their uh, city centre changes that we're kind of starting to see now benefiting the city centre in terms of greater residential uh, um, activity in there and um, some new property developments. In terms of rural New Zealand, we work extensively uh, through the provinces. So we've worked a, a lot in Southland, um, Gore, Balclutha, worked right throughout Otago. Um, most recently, we've been working in Wairapa, uh, Taranaki, and as I mentioned, um, Whanganui at the moment too. So yes, we've had a, um, a great time working with Steve, long relationship with Steve, and, uh, and I know we've spoken to a number of you, um, of the councillors at uh, sessions in the past as well. So today's session, what we really want to do is, um, we've got a, I think we've got about uh, half an hour to 40 minutes here, talking about some of the trends that are going on, the relevance for Waipa's town centres, how through some agile strategy, uh, council can support some of the changes that we're starting to see right now. Uh, how do we get there? So some of the uh, some of the initiatives you can you can undertake, and um, and some of the priorities from our perspective, the things that you can actually do to um, to get some of these activities happening. Okay, so I'm just going to kick off with some of the key trends that we're seeing, uh, both across New Zealand, but also particularly within our provincial centres. So and, and these will be no surprise for many of you. So what are the key trends that we've seen since, since COVID? Those shifts in purchasing channels, that means that people have increasingly gone online. Uh, in many cases, they've been forced to go online. So traditional demographics that have never been used to purchasing products um, through their computers or their phones, uh, that's been something that they've had to do. So it's seen a seismic shift in, in purchasing behavior changes um, from demographics we never would have necessarily thought so older people have had to be part of this. Young people have, have, have gotten earlier than they would have tr traditionally. And while online spending was growing, it's, it's um, significantly increased uh, since the advent of COVID. With, we talk about captive spending and how it's changed uh, the New Zealand economy. So New Zealanders typically spend nine billion a year on overseas travel. Without that ability to travel, a lot of that money has stayed in our economy. And you've seen it translated into those huge queues of the likes of Mitre 10 and Bunnings. You've seen it translated into people putting money into their home environments, the amount of landscaping that's going on, the amount of additions, people spending at places like Briscoe's. In times of, uh, that we're seeing right now where there's, there's a degree of uncertainty, people hunker down and they love to do what we call nest and that's getting those good things around them making sure their home environments are, are right. We've also seen those big changes around uh, flexible working which has meant people have spent more time in their home environments and they've found reasons that they needed to, to go and enrich those. So that has particularly helped many of the businesses uh, around the Waikato, those uh, home interiors businesses, um, uh, construction supplies, plumbing supplies, across the board, uh, there will be few businesses that haven't benefited um, that are involved in these sectors. So we talk about lifestyle being a priority. People are increasingly concerned about getting those good things around them, um, things that make them feel good, uh, almost like a security blanket for, for an adult, essentially. Um, we also talk about experiences being priorities, and you will have seen the times that you've been out to cafes or out to restaurants. Um, you'll see people spending more on premium type foods, and that's all because of the fact that people are wanting to, again, enrich their lifestyles. With these types of purchasing behaviours, that's really played well into many of the artists and businesses that we have in our, in our town centres. Um, it's, it's played well into the cafes when they have been able to open and the restaurants when they have been able to open, despite the fact that at the moment many people have got constraint through the, um, they've got constraint through the uh, ability to get capacity in those environments. Property prices obviously are buoying confidence. So um, people are feeling kind of, dare I say, artificially wealthy. 
And that has really pushed um, uh, people's confidence in investing in big ticket items like furniture, home improvements like we talked about, new vehicles, and all of these aspects. So, you know, it's very interesting. It has confounded um, uh, economists. It's confounded many of us uh, who are dealing with these types of um, economies around New Zealand and around the world. So I guess we really didn't realise just the power of what that captive spend would do. So the other thing we've noticed is that consumers are increasingly values driven, particularly our young consumers. So they're looking to um, you know, spend their money with where it counts. And that in many cases has meant local businesses have, have, have benefited from that priority. So that's about supporting local, but we've also seen people um, strongly supporting those businesses that are doing the right things in communities as well. So whether that be, um, you know, giving money or goods to the, the food banks, uh, doing sustainability initiatives and, and all of these types of things, consumers are increasingly orientated towards values-driven businesses. So that's an important thing to think about for for our businesses, but also collectively our, our town centres as well. So those are the kind of good things that are happening at the moment, but we kind of need to be aware of the emerging issues. So what are we seeing ahead? And this is, this is these are things that ourselves as a business that are dealing in a lot of these environments are seeing, but also um, many of the others that we work with. So the economists, the banks, um, major property owners, uh, large retail groups, so while we saw a really significant bounce in that economy uh, after the first lockdown, and that was driven by people kind of surprised with where things got to, maybe we felt like we were getting off um, uh, with a lot less impact than other places had. The perception, the, under, the, the feeling now is that we are gonna see a, a more likely a limited bounce on reopening. So we're not gonna see that uh, unleashing of spending uh, yes, we're coming up, coming up to a Christmas period right now, so that's a typical spending boost anyhow. But there is concern that we won't necessarily see that, that boost this time around. And there's reasons behind this. One is that the increase uh, in an interest rates will, without a doubt, slow spend. Um, we know that people are fairly highly leveraged out there, and despite the fact that they're feeling pretty happy about their property prices, we do know that that market is starting to cool off. So the messaging coming through from agents uh, and the property sector in general is that some of that uh, bullish behaviour is starting to come back from consumers, and there's a little bit more reticence out there. We know that the property market has really underpinned that, that confidence in spend. Great news about the milk prices. We just know how um, that drives that confidence in, a, in our rural economies. We've seen that particularly around the likes of Gore and, and Otago. Um, uh, but if we think about the general consumer market, property is the kind of thing that they are um, most concerned with. So that's combined to create, to create less economic certainty. And then we've also got this other consideration too. Supply challenges are impacting the economy. So businesses aren't necessarily able to get the products that they need to sell. That means they're, not, they're, they're, they're losing potential sales and also potential goodwill. So these are real considerations um, that are impacting across most sectors at the moment. So... How does that differ from 2020? You know, again, we go back to the um, same time last year and we were all kind of feeling in a pretty confident position. We had come out of COVID, yet the rest of the world, well, we thought we'd come out of COVID. The rest of the world was um, facing some pretty dire straits. But right now with the advent of Delta, uh, that COVID in the community is, uh, is, is a huge threat. If anyone saw the stuff article about what's gone on in Taranaki today, the, the, the impact that it's had on the town centre, uh, the, those rural town centres, has been significant. People have just stopped spending, except for those places that have had to spend. So um, the uncertainty of this. Last night we presented to Kapiti uh, District Council and uh, in, in a very same sort of similar type of theme, but 
um, in, in an area where there's a significant, a, a very large uh, older population, and the concerns the older population have from being in these types of environments is is significant. And so many councils right now are considering how best to consider how best to, to, to support resilience in their communities. So yes, with this COVID in the community, uh, Delta in the community, there's a high perceived risk and uncertainty from consumers. Doesn't take much to, um, to uh, stem the spending flow and that confidence. Spending's already come back from last year. So um, yes, people went on a big spending spree. Uh, in many cases, they've kind of got what they wanted. Um, there's, there's little else that they need. So, and we saw a very similar trend in Australia too. We work extensively through um, um, uh, parts, uh, through uh, New South Wales and in Queensland. And uh, in New South Wales, many of those big retailers that saw a huge growth um, after their first lockdown, after the second lockdown, um, it, that spending did not come back. So there are some uh, learnings that we can take from some of these other areas around. We talked about working overseas. We, we, we watch um, uh, markets that we've worked in in the past very closely. In the UK at the moment, uh, there's a lot of, lot of concern and there's likelihood that they'll go back into mask wearing, compulsory mask wearing. So, Fascinating just some of these dynamics that are going on and how they're, um, it's resonating in those town centres and city centres. And we're also we're hearing a lot in the media about those wider economic indicators and headwinds. So, you know, the challenges of, of managing some of this big debt that's going on at the moment um, and wider concerns that people are having. And there are some new threats as well. So that um, those the trending pandemic related challenges. A permanent change in consumer behaviour. We, when, when people have been uh, unable to, um, we call it transformational behaviour. So if you if, if there's something that you do on a regular basis and you can't do it for a week, it's, there's a high likelihood that you will go back to that. But over a period of time, you actually get out of those types of typical habits, those habitual type uh, destinations. And so, for instance, those coffee places that you went to every, every week or every day, you may find new choices. And these are the things that, that have been impacting businesses across New Zealand and across the world. So that permanent change in consumer behaviour. And similarly, online, if you typically went and, and bought products in the store for many years and all of a sudden you have to deal with that retailer online, there's a high chance that you'll continue to do that. And that's what we've seen. In terms of uh, WIPA, you know that at the moment there's these, this loss of that Auckland Drive market visitor, and they've been really propelling spend in WIPA. So you know that time away that people could and they come down, they'll be buying those gift items, things to make themselves feel good, experiences to make themselves feel good. And this is a similar trend that we've seen in other characterful areas. We worked, we've worked a lot in Nelson, so similar situations in Nelson. Um, uh, the Wairarapa, so Greytown is a very, very popular destination at the moment, benefiting significantly from that drive market from, um, from Manawatu, but also from Wellington. Cancellation of events, we're just seeing these are falling off around the country. Um, uh, like dominoes. So yesterday, again, we were working for Kapiti District Council, the big food fair that attracts um, many thousands of people was cancelled yesterday. And there's a lot likelihood that anything that's, that's planned for the next few months will be cancelled because there is just this huge uncertainty right now. We go back to the loss of retail anchors in, um, in Waipa. So the likes of the Bunnings um, that consolidated into a larger site all of those businesses bring, bring people on a regular basis to an area. Similarly with banks, although that banks have had a, a lot less of a, uh, a need, but they are still destinations where people visit on a regular habitual basis. And those, those visits typically coincide with other visits. So trips to the coffee shop or, or, or trips to other businesses in the area. What makes uh, Te Aumutu and Cambridge um, extra special? Of course, it's character for buildings. So those, and many of those are earthquake prone buildings. Being based in Wellington, we've been, um, that's been part of our lives uh, for, for, for decades. 
but for other areas, it's new territory. And for those smaller properties in, um, uh, in provincial centres, they're quite expensive to get, uh, to get um, earthquake proofed. And in many cases, it's a challenge for property owners in terms of economic return on those. Loss of the MD, those mum and dad businesses that are through the through YPAR, they are the ones that make YPAR special. And um, when we lose those types of businesses, uh, that's a real challenge because we with the chain businesses, you can find those anywhere. The mum and dad businesses are the ones that set the place apart. And if we ask consumers, it's those places that the people are wanting to go to. And finally, an act of frontages. You will all recognise this happening around our town and city centres. So the loss of a store and then a, then a physiotherapist goes in and frosts the window or, or other types of office type users, within a, they break precincts and they are quite challenging in terms of creating that vitality and that vibrancy in a town centre. So how does it impact businesses? At the moment, reinvestment capital is lacking in the retail sector, retail and the hospitality sector, and particularly tourism. And that confidence impacts appetite for growth. Banks are very reticent about supporting retail, hospitality, or tourism sectors because of the uncertainty in trading performance. Uh, uncertainty in trading performance, uncertainty in, in, in terms of supply chain. Um, so we've seen a, a lot less willingness from, from banks to support retail. In fact, talking to a, a retail shop fit out um, specialist, he said, we've got virtually no inquiry from New Zealand retailers. And this is a big shop fitter. Yet Australia um, still has that conference, but in many cases, those businesses are self-funding their work. With the uh, changes that the government's uh, made around lease uh, obligations, Property owners are often subsidising tenants now, so that's meant that property owners haven't had that capital to reinvest in, in their properties, whether that be facades or strengthening or other types of improvements. And then again, we've got this cautious and caution in employment. So while we've got pretty full employment at the moment, um, you know that what we in many cases these sectors, the places that people start their, their working journey, their, their work-life journey. So less appetite for businesses to employ those school leavers. Cost creep and uh, limited ability for wage growth across these sectors is meaning that there's greater competition for retail, hospitality and hospitality workers. Um, that's seen businesses reduce their hours, um, really because they just haven't had that capacity to be able to, to manage. So less certainty impacts confidence and appetite for investment for our um, commercial stakeholders across our town and city centres. But you know, YPAR's got some special, uh, some edge. There's resilience factors around its rural resilience. We've just heard about that before. And um, you know, right through COVID, uh, I, I guess probably one of the most beautiful comments, um, we did a lot of work with uh, Gore District Council around right through COVID, working with all the sectors and bringing them together for some joined up conversations. And I never forget one of the stakeholders saying, Chris, welcome to our world. You know, we've uh, locked down. Um, that's, that's our environment in many cases because we are confined to the farm and we've just got you know, head down and tail up for weeks on end. So this is not new territory for us. Um, so the rural resilience is a major factor, something we can't take for granted, but it's something that we should be, we should be um, celebrating. Residential growth, of course, that, that, that uh, growth in property values has been significant, and that spin-off from Auckland has been significant as well. So one of the things we, we, we saw back in 2019 when we talked to um, stakeholders in Cambridge was the significant contribution that many of those uh, older folk had made coming into the Cambridge economy um, from Auckland as um, they'd sold up large properties and were really keen to contribute to uh, Cambridge's economy. Strong cohesive business communities. The, the Cambridge Chamber is absolutely outstanding. Great leadership, um, uh, significant participation across many sectors. And I guess we were really humbled when we were part of those conversations just to see so many different sectors participating from 
architects very keen to, um, uh, to, to see regeneration, sympathetic regeneration happening uh, through to businesses that were wanting to help each other. And again, that leadership of the, the chamber with the support of Waipa District Council's ED team um, was, uh, was really gratifying to see. And I think that's one thing that sets Waipa apart significantly. Uh, equally, we've got champions in the private sector. We met a number of leading property owners when we were working in TA, uh, all keen to put money into their properties uh, without necessarily that immediate return. But they, you know, their hearts were in um, Waipa and they saw the, the need to make sure that the town sector stayed strong and resilient, both social, for, for social and economic reasons. And then finally, those emerging... Is it just me or have we lost Chris? I've lost Chris, I think. Yeah, we've lost. Oh, you're back in, can I back in now, guys? Oh, yep, you're there yep, now. Yep. Sorry. Shall I just back back up again? Where, where did you lose me? Emerging sectors. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, the emerging sectors, what we're talking about here really is the, the, the growth of tech and um, in terms of software and also some of the agricultural tech and large scale manufacturing that's happening out on the fringes. So this is really exciting for the area. It, it's bringing in many cases, high value roles, and it really is leveraging the ability for people to benefit from lifestyle and that wonderful environment that you have um, without having to do that travel. I'm not sure whether we are touching on the, um, uh, the flexible, flexible working environments, but you know, we're working in a number of areas which have seen significant growth because those people aren't leaving every day. So um, hopefully I'll touch on that shortly. I'm pretty sure I do. Waipa's Edge, so leveraging differentiation. So there's characterful differentiated destinations. We know um, these are the things that consumers love things that are different. People are tired of that same old, same old. And I know that people will constantly say, oh, we could go across to Hamilton. But at the end of the day, that offer and experience is a very, very different one. So it's about finding those things that you guys can, can succeed in um, and own, essentially. So where's YPAR's opportunity? Number one is stemming that spending attrition. So a significant amount of money leaves our economies across New Zealand uh, every day. Um, but Waipa, we knew from when we were working there, a significant amount was going over to Hamilton, not only for the people that were working there, but for people that were going for hospitality experiences or entertainment. So if we can work hard on encouraging that uh, local sentiment and local support for businesses, because you know, people are often pretty close to their local town centre, and yet they take things for granted. It's easy to take things for granted, but when we visit Cambridge or TA, um, you know, we're always delighted with the wonderful stores um, and hospitality environments you have there. So sometimes it's kind of worth just reorientating people to re-engage them with their local offer, reminding them of that. As a rural, uh, as an agricultural uh, powerhouse, it's important to be uh, leveraging our provenance, the things that we're actually producing locally, and those artisan businesses that are actually using those types of products within their, within their um, uh, menu items. I know that um, the Chamber have been really keen to see more and more of that. So uh, local sourced menu items uh, on a regular basis across as many menus as they possibly can in the area. Further develop as these regional destinations. I think this is a really important part. You know, it's, 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 it's a great drive across from uh, the Bay of Plenty or down from Auckland. Uh, and what you find in places like Cambridge is, is a very characterful and, and unique shopping environment. 
Most recently, we've been working in the Southern Wire Wrapper, and, and many people will know just how successful Greytown has been in transforming its um, proposition and experience by assembling a great range of interesting and, as I say, experiential type uh, retail and hospitality environments. So that's something to, you know, we've got lots of great examples of these kinds of things happening, but Cambridge has always been thought of as one of those iconic destinations as well. And then we talk about further curating offer and experience. Yes, we've got some great stuff going on, but we've also got some stuff that's pretty average as well. So if we're able to get and support some of these property owners and businesses to keep evolving, helping them better understand their market and the opportunities that are there, these are key parts. And this is, I know this is a role that Steve and the ED team have been playing significantly encouraging businesses to better understand their market and the opportunities that exist within those. I'll go back to the Cambridge Town Centre concept plan. So, you know, that's been a, a, a fantastic uh, blueprint for where Cambridge can, can do particularly well. Um, and it's worth going back to these types of objectives and then ensuring that we are contemporising um, our understanding of those and making sure that we are um, leveraging those particularly in this very dynamic market where demand expectations and values are changing significantly from our consumers. So what can we do to respond? Well, number one is that hospitality's, hospitality sector is our new anchor. You know, once upon a time, um, retail was the anchor. But today, it's the coffee shop that you'll be going to on a regular basis. And it's those types of businesses that we've got to, to further strengthen to support because when we've got a strong hospitality sector, our retail sector follows through. Hospitality is the reason that people come and connect with a town centre or an environment. And then once they're in those areas, that, that spending is shared. So people have that connection with neighbouring retail businesses. Hence the reason you'll see more and more hospitality in malls and other big shopping destinations. So while we can't favour any one sector, we just need to be mindful that hospitality is a key, key thing that connects people on a regular and habitual basis, and that will help drive retail success as well. Particularly now, and we've, we've got lots of good learnings for what's going on overseas, but creating those environments that enable resilience, so that breach is a key aspect, particularly with um, the, the, the advent of Delta, and capacity. So as we've seen, you know, with businesses not being able to fill their restaurants because of the spatial space requirements. So being able to create that capacity is vital. We're working with a number of councils right now on activating street spaces on a temporary basis, but hopefully permanently, to enable hospitality venues to create safe and capacious environments. So this is something that uh, many councils are now giving pace to, and uh, in some cases, removing the costs of licensing for outdoor areas, creating shared spaces so that people can, um, <clears throat> so that businesses can share some of these spaces together. We've done a lot of work around love local, celebrating local businesses, but celebrating and prioritizing those local businesses is something we need to keep re-emphasizing. Uh, it's something that needs to be a, a constant theme um, from our, our, our town center leaders, from our uh, elected members. Creating reasons and experiences to re-engage people with the town centre. So while we can't have big events at the moment, we can do small things. We can create small activities that people may encounter when they come into their town centre. At the moment, we've, um, we've been working with Wellington City Council as they've pivoted from a big Christmas event to more likely small little pocket type things that, that people will just encounter when they come and do their Christmas shopping. So magicians street performances, small um, uh, sing-songs and things like that. So people will come and find these and, and, and kind of warm to them and, 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 and talk fondly about those as opposed to a big events that, that are no longer appropriate in, in this current environment. 
And then finally, strengthening that differentiation to ensure the townships have got a defensible edge, something that sets them apart from their competing destinations. So what's that? That's, that's really around uh, you know, supporting great hospitality experiences, so, um, ensuring our businesses are listening and responding to the markets, and creating something that other places just haven't got. Our second immediate focus, so collaborative efforts. And again, this is where that relationship, that strong relationship with the chamber and that strong understanding from the ED team is particularly important. So collaborative efforts, enabling outdoor dining environments and that culture of connection. So encouraging people to come into the town centre on a regular basis for social connection, for, for um, to, just to enjoy themselves. Again, re-emphasising the value of the town centre uh, for its social, social benefit. Low-key town centre activities I just talked about that people encounter, they, talk, they, they take part in and they, they talk fondly about. Devising enables, enabling ways for locals to rediscover their, their town centres. So whether that be some pop-up pocket parks, well, that type of thing that starts to encourage new demographics into our town centres or people that may have strayed their, their, their loyalties and their um, may have strayed to other areas, bring them back and to show what's gone on and the changes that have happened. Talked about celebrating local priority those, and the customers that are, are leading the charge. So talking uh, about some of the good things that are going on and our, and our customer champions out there. And then helping the town centres develop these values-led initiatives, such as environmental shifts. That might be uh, more walking and cycling. That might be enabling greater uh, um, sustainability focus from our town centres. All the things that uh, contemporary consumers are increasingly looking for. So if we get it right, what would that success look like? So greater commercial confidence through shared thinking and resilience. And this means that businesses are working together increasingly, and we're going to need to see more of that through in this Delta age. We're going to need to see businesses potentially supporting um, others by selling their products if they're not able to open. We're needing to um, show our town centres as cohesive uh, environments to come to as maybe stores aren't able to open because they're impacted by Delta. Active and vibrant town centres draw people through their vitality. So just environments that people want to be part of. <clears throat> Consumer preference, that priority and advocacy for local traders. So uh, we can't overstate that enough. These businesses really do need that support right now. And we can do this uh, meaningfully through these types of initiatives. And again, businesses leading <coughs> sustainability and social initiatives. It's, it's absolutely vital. So, and I know we kind of share this vision with Steve, but um, where to from here? So channeling the town centres and businesses to capture a greater share of local spend. Um, councils have got that great reach out to, out to their, their audiences. And um, it's, it's important that we kind of leverage that reach to be able to send some of these positive messages and drive that, commun that, that, that confidence. Supporting the creation of spaces and places that respond to the need and opportunity. So again, we talked about pop-up pocket parks, uh, pop-up dining environments, things that uh, are going to enable the success of businesses and support businesses who are, are keen to, keen to um, enable this. Collaborative plan to strengthen economic resilience and living and operating with Delta. So this is continuing. We've got teams at the moment who are working with councils right now in in looking at the things that the councils can do to support businesses in those environments as we navigate this kind of uncharted territory. Strengthening awareness and priority for Waipa as a visitor destination. So as soon as um, the borders are opened up, that people, as they start to come back, let's make sure that they're going to prioritise their spending here in Waipa. And then using this opportunity to further curate the town centre's offers and experiences. So I you know what we've seen in other areas is businesses have disappeared um, because maybe of COVID vulnerability that um, the councils and the chambers have worked collectively to encourage the right types of bus businesses that are going to add value, add best value to the neighbours and to those town centres um, 
uh, are very important. That's something that can, can happen quite easily. Coming up to the end now, but what other moves can support success? We've seen in other areas, councils um, considering land purchase uh, in the city centre. We've worked with a number of councils that are doing that around New Zealand, and it's a big move in the UK right now. So councils are, are very busy purchasing properties, strategic properties that will enable them to have regenerative effect. Uh, Auckland City Council is a large property owner, and we've worked extensively with them in the likes of Pan Muir uh, and Orihanga and uh, Glen Innes around some of these, uh, these moves to purchase property. So that's something to think about. Uh, there's plenty of precedents out there to support it. Strengthening these commercial communities to support greater resilience. So the work that the Chamber's doing, being able to add value to that. Dedicated town centre strategies to deliver contemporary solutions. So again, this is where we were in 2019, but where do we need to be in 2022? And that strategic curation of the town centre offers and experiences to create differentiation. So again, we're looking at a very uh, dynamic space at the moment, but if we're able to leverage some of these uh, opportunities, we can start creating environments that people just um, want to come to, want to be part of and want to invest in. So I don't know how we're doing for time, guys. How's that looking? You're right on the button, actually, Chris. Oh, outstanding. <laughs> I think you might have rehearsed this a few times before, so good on you. <laughs> I had a very diligent um, team member from the comms team yesterday, and she rang me to ask me about the presentation. Well, about an hour later, um, I think I'd been through the whole thing, and I thought, oh, gosh, I don't need to rehearse this now. <laughs> well, I'm certain, that, uh, I'm certain that we've um, got questions relating to that, so... Um, maybe a time to um, to take the presentation down and uh, and look at some faces if you're happy to do that. Absolutely. I'd just like to welcome our two uh, chief executives um, from the chambers. Are they with us now, Steve? Yes, I am, Graham. Thank you. Great to have you along, and um, I guess uh, that fits in nicely that presentation with uh, some of our thoughts going forward uh, as we come out of this COVID lockdown. Yeah. Over to you, Steve. Oh, Bruce has got a question. Sorry. Yes, I have. Uh, Lorraine or Chris could answer it or may try to answer it. You put on greater spend, uh, capture a greater share of um, uh, local spend. But my experience in locally is that um, people will travel, even or folk to Hamilton, um, to get a deal when it actually they don't look at their time and um, cost to get there and back. How do we how do we change people's mindset that they should shop local? Yeah, look, look, a great example to that was um, just really strong media and, and, and encouraging, really putting a face to those businesses, uh, personalising it. A lovely story we had from Gore when we worked on their um, local mm -hmm. spending strategies about six years ago. And uh, we had a, a call from a big jeweller there in Gore. And um, I mean, Gore's not dissimilar from, from TA, a huge uh, dairy um, stronghold there. And, um, you know, a lot of wealth within that community uh, in terms of spending potential. Anyhow, um, the council had initiated a, a, a Love Gore promotion, which uh, has continued to this day. Every store has Love Gore on its door, and it's constantly reinforced in the media and by the elected members. Anyhow, a, um, a woman was wanting to buy a, a, an expensive graduation bracelet for her daughter, and she was heading down to Dunedin to buy it. And she got to Balclutha and she <clears throat> something clicked in her brain. She thought, why am I driving down here? Went back to um, the jeweler in Gort and told them the story and, uh, and spent a significant amount of money. So it's those types of things. I think personalising, showing um, just the value of those local businesses to the community and just how important they are in our lives. Um, Chris, maybe it's an opportunity if I could just grab a bit of time, Graham. Is that okay? Absolutely. Welcome. Cool. So Chris and Lorraine, lovely to see you guys again. It's always a, um, a valley platform listening to your roundup and trends and ideas. And thank you for your favourable comments on the Chamber as well. Um, I just made a few notes um, in no particular order. First of all, around the shop local. And obviously the Chamber is a huge advocate of that. We um, have a brand, Totally Locally Cambridge, and 
It is a brand that we make no money off whatsoever. It's there um, as our little hidden gem to advocate in that space. And we've got a really fresh new program coming in 2022. And we would certainly encourage anybody within council businesses or the likes to uplift and use that brand. Um, and obviously it could be extended and replicated very simply in Te Awamutu as well. So carry in thoughts on that one. Um, in terms of um, your reference to social and community connection, Liz Stoic, myself and a couple of others have been working. In fact, we had a session last night called Reimagine Cambridge and Steve was on board as well. And that is very much uh, looking at that outdoor dining and looking at ways in which to draw people into our townships and, you know, let them then disperse into our, our restaurants and cafes. So there's some nice work going on in that space. And one of the things, for example, we're, we're investigating is a night market up in the town, um, town square. So, you know, it just has that wonderful um, visibility and feel and, and fit. So um, around safe socialisation, um, market days and the likes of, obviously, to coincide this year with Centre's visit. Um, I think also it's, it's interesting and, and I'm, I'm pretty new to the region. I've only been down here a couple of years, but that ongoing debate, do we market our districts as WIPA um, or do we separate the townships? And I think certainly where people are, we're looking to change consumer behaviours and making new choices. We do enjoy, certainly in Cambridge, wonderful patronage and destination shopping from the greater Waikato whether that be Hamilton or Matter Matter, and actually stretching them through our region a bit more, I think has enormous potential. So let that WIPA debate continue and look at some clever ways in which we take ourselves to market and educate people that we are a district of our own outside of, you know, the greater Waikato area, I think has some merit as well. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts around the three-step vaccination certification entry. Um, in talking with Hospitality New Zealand as part of that open dining conversation, it's challenging the cost of putting effectively a bouncer outside your establishment. And whilst I know Hospital New Zealand are challenging that and trying to enhance a much quicker seamless you know, accessibility, got any thoughts on making that easier, reducing the cost, sharing the load in our town? Yeah, certainly, Kelly. I, th I don't think this is going to be doable. Um, I think the government's realising this pretty quickly. We've worked quite closely with Restaurant, New uh, Restaurant Association and uh, Hospitality NZ, and they've got some fairly strong um, lobbying going on. I think the, realistically, this is just not going, to, apart from in a, uh, environments that are already controlled um, with have door control, such as bars and nightclubs, um, in traditional smaller scale environments, this is not going to be possible. And the, the government will have to, I'm, I'm always positive they can have to relent because this is going to be unsustainable for yeah. the vast majority of businesses. Absolutely. And the only other thing, Chris, I'd like to um, comment on, I think you've covered all the posts beautifully and a lot of the stuff um, is quite fitting with the collab we've got going on with the council. Um, I, I've been very um, impressed with the willingness from Waipa District Council to look at ways in which they can support ongoing. And, you know, one question I ask all of the elected members or people that are making um, decisions in there is what is the, the impact of this decision on business? And, you know, for example, we know that there's a particular um, pocket in our town that has some signage issues. And so, you know, we're having some, some challenging advocacy around is that the, is now the time to enforce that? And clearly it's not as businesses start to recover. So, you know, quite often we um, prod at the council, but for all the right reasons to just just think outside of your square and into the, the broader you know, business proposition. Most of the time we get a real willingness and, and um, buy-in and, and yeah, it's all great. But I ask everybody in the room, if you're making a decision that might impact on business, whether wherever that might be, the one question, what is the impact it's going to have? And, you know, um, we've got really good open communication with the chamber um, and, and council. So have those conversations and get our point of view on it. But other than that, great stuff. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks, Kelly. We're very, very conscious as a council of our business. So well put. Absolutely. Okay. Um, anything to add, anybody? <laughs> There's a few hints in that report about what WIPA is doing, wasn't there? But uh, my lips are sealed. Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Um, yeah, I'm a retailer in Te Mutu, and um, I was very interested in your uh, presentation, um, particularly in when you mentioned the importance of being values driven um, and and being different, which I take, you know, we, we don't have the same big box stores here. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think people uh, do like coming to a place where maybe there isn't a on, on furniture and flooring, like a Harvey Harvey Norman or a Big Save, um, and it's an opportunity to, yeah, uh, focus on the experience that they're having in the store. And it, I agree that's really important. Um, I do also think you're dead right in that the hospitality sector is is absolutely key, um, and it's a it's a big um, plus that Cambridge does have. It's got a great um, selection of cafes and restaurants. Um, so T. O. Mutu needs to work on that a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting um, presentation. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you very much, Andrew. I, I got to say, one of the things I probably didn't touch on, but we're seeing it more and more, is that we need to get the younger people's lenses on what we should be doing in our town centres. So we need to be thinking of our successive audiences. Um, in our, in our organisation, we've got a number of young people and it's been fascinating. We've been doing a, huge, a, a large consultation recently with um, businesses across a, uh, an area where there's going to be some fairly significant changes in terms of transport corridor. And, and older businesses are very reluctant to see any change. Um, younger businesses are, 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 are all for this. And <coughs> The younger businesses are going, you know, there's a huge trajectory for them. The, the older businesses are just really trying to cling on to what they've had. And so, and I speak from an older point of view, so I think it's really important that, um, that we encourage our businesses to have very open thoughts and that we bring younger people into this conversation so that they can see that what the, the needs and aspirations of, of our emerging audience is going to be. Um, so that we continue to have that relevance and that we can continue to, you know, yesterday's conversation with one of the staffers from um, Waipa District Council, you know, what, what, what's the reason that younger people are attracted to, to Waipa? She, she shared with all those things. And it's those things that we really need to be getting across to the businesses as well. Chris, I believe, some of the, the, um, I, think, I believe that some of the businesses that are really, really set up for online trading are doing particularly well at the moment, particularly well. Yeah, significantly. And, and that's because, well, firstly, because uh, unfortunately, you guys have been limited in what you can do. So yeah. um, there's been that pent up. But, but without a doubt, um, that's, that's stayed. And for the businesses that have been look, across all sectors, people have been, the things that people have been buying is absolutely amazing online, whether it be tractors <laughs> or whether it be you know, as furniture. Andrew, you'll be seeing the same thing. Um, and people are buying stuff from, well, I, I visited a big furniture store last week up in Kapiti. Uh, Andrew, you'll be very familiar with them, Paula's, and they are selling products all over New Zealand because people are going online. It's, it's, it's not now about where the business is. It's about that digital visibility. Thanks, Chris. Just, Steve. Yep. Yeah, I wonder if there's any other questions on, on or discussions on kind of marketing and visitor attraction. As, yep. as a way of supporting um, our CBDs in that sector. Well, I, um, through Graham, I mean, um, it's not a question so much, but um, uh, you, you won't know Chris and Lorraine, but I'm chairman of Destination Cambridge, which operates the eyesight in Cambridge. And uh, we really welcome uh, Level 2, um, you know, uh, our district makes up uh, our, our visitors, um, a, a majority are domestic, um, and Auckland makes up a big part of that, but uh, there's the rest of the country too. So, you know, this is going to be great for, for 
um, a lot of businesses, not only retail and hospitality, but uh, there's a lot of mum and dads with their B&Bs and that type of things, as well as the motels and hotels in Cambridge or in Waipa. So we, we really welcome this and uh, it's, it's going to, you know, just in time, hopefully we can, uh, hopefully um, this momentum can continue and, uh, and it'll be just in time for Christmas and the summer and everything like that too. So um, yeah, roll on tomorrow and, uh, and welcome all our visitors to, to our region and uh, we've got so much to offer here. Um, so it's fantastic. Great. We, we, need, we need champions like yourself. I, I still remember our conversation uh, when we after the uh, session we did in Cambridge last time. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for your presentation today. Thank you. No more? Our chamber yeah. ladies, any more questions in of the presentation or direct questions to council? Yeah, just, just last question. I, I guess when you opened, you talked about trends and the purchasing and, you know, we all, I, I reiterate, obviously everybody is buying online these days and I guess yeah. that's a wonderful thing. Our businesses need to understand how they market outside of our town and we're still getting to, to grips with that. But then we have that challenge as well, um, how to get that click and collect locally orientated any comment on that, Chris? I, th I think we've just, here's a good example. We just, you actually really just talked about it before, removing any barriers. So what can we do with our town centre to be <clears throat> the most friendly, the most welcoming, the most easy to prioritise? It may be that we look at, you know, in terms of our parking, what are we going to do? Create some ten, more 10 minute zones, more parking that, that, uh, could even be parked and it's dedicated to click and collect, whether that be coffees or whether that be products that people have bought. Um, just really just, again, re-emphasizing to people, keep it local and, um, and make that choice local. I think it's a really important thing. Thank you. No questions from me, but um, yeah, thank you. It was actually really great um, little presentation here. So yeah, no questions at this stage. I'm sure I'll have plenty as soon as we all hang up, as always happens, but <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Kerri ann It's good. Right. Anything to finish off with, Steve? No, I'm right. uh, Roger, Roger, had a Roger's, Roger's got his hand up. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really interested in the presentation and the mention, of course, of um, promotion and marketing of it as a as a living center. And one of the advantages that we've got in Cambridge is that uh, we've still got the old traditional high street that's full of independent retailers. And when it comes to linking with the chamber, and I used to be the chamber in Rotorua, so I uh, am aware of what Kelly's going through. But when you've got individual retailers, they're more likely to support promotion. When you've got the big boys, the nationals that are in the centre, somehow they're not really interested in joining in any promotional activity. And so I think, in a way, we're lucky and we really should take advantage of that. What's your comment on that? Yeah, you, you are very right. We just So a lot of what we do is developing strategies for city and town centres. So... Most of the cities in New Zealand we've worked on developing retail strategies, dedicated retail strategies. But we, um, but we also do smaller areas as well. We've just recently done a very characterful village, again, in the Kapiti Coast. So the Kapiti Coast is north of Wellington, and uh, there are a number of villages through the Kapiti Coast, and the council is progressively doing uh, retail strategies for each of these villages. But Kapiti is a very unique place in, in New Zealand right now. Is it, um, is it about to uh, see the opening of Transmission Gully, which is a generational uh, road connection north and south of uh, Kapiti? But also um, it's had significant growth in, uh, from flexible working. So um, around 40% uh, of its population usually leave uh, Kapiti, of its working population leave Kapiti every day. Now they're not. And uh, with many of those people now around the town centres, they're back and they're enriching those town centres and spending money and looking for new experiences. 
But the, the, the town centre that we've been working in most recently is a very characterful uh, place. And people, and what's, what's really working well in the consumer market at the moment is nostalgia. People love these smaller businesses. They, they, they're harking back to what was familiar and comfortable. And, um, and these types of smaller places are very, very successful because of this. And those are the things we should be leveraging if we possibly can. The other factor I think you might like to comment on is a strategy to bring people living in the town centres back in. So encouraging accommodation development within town centres. And that's something, of course, that we're really interested in. That's right. Yes. So we've been just been working in Nelson and you might see some of the news that's going on in Nelson at the moment with the residential development that's going on there. But uh, after this, with, with the new changes in government um, uh, planning regulations, all the town centres are now looking at how they can benefit from this, particularly those ones around commuter corridors. Uh, and and we just, we've, got, we've got people working flat out on these types of projects right now off the back of this, these changes. Susan. Yeah, um, thanks, Chris and, and Lorraine. Um, look, I, I don't, I don't have any great pearls of wisdom or actually questions for you, but because I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a retailer or um, involved in hospitality, but I can tell you what I do do, and that is I buy lots of stuff, and 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 I'm and I'm the <laughs> person that is in charge of a lot of that decision making as a, as a female, you know, running a home. So I guess as a person who's probably in as I say, making most of those decisions, isn't, is there any merit in focusing any particular uh, attention to those primary decision makers? And, and secondly, finding out from those women with those checkbooks, <laughs> what works best for them? Because it's not really about the retailers, it's about the purchasers. It's about, it's about the people who are parting with their cash. And I guess I look around in Tilmutu in particular in terms of that retail space. And we've got some excellent examples of, of, um, of uh, shops that, uh, retail outlets that migrated very quickly and very nimbly and created um, a really good platform for themselves in that retail space over COVID. And they continue to do so. And they, they, they ship um, their um, products or their, their, um, their wares all over um, New Zealand as a result of it. So I wonder if there's any merit in actually finding out, approaching, looking down our main streets and finding out really excellent examples of places that we're able to convince the, the women with the checkbooks <laughs> to, com, to part with their money. Because that, that's, that, it's, about the, it's about the shopper's experience, isn't it? And the, and the ease of that experience and find out what those motivators are. And aren't you best to look at the better examples rather than um, just sort of generically create um, campaigns um, that aren't targeted, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yes, yeah, Susan, you're very right. And, and, you know, there's a common theme to all of those businesses you're talking about. I can picture them right now. And, and Lorraine's definitely picturing because I think she went into many of those businesses and bought stuff. And so, you know, we still connect with those businesses because we see them on Facebook. Those are the ones that are, that are talking to their customers. They're, they're finding out what they want. They're understanding what the people that are <coughs> shopping with them want. And they are constantly adapting their offer and experience. The other thing is that they're leading people into their lives and they're, you know, they're showing what's going on in their shops on a regular basis. So they are connecting, we call it depth of connection. <laughs> so um, people, people orientate towards those businesses because there's a, there's a, there's a personal connection, there's empathy, um, and the fact that the people feel that they have a part in that business. And I think that there's a lot of learnings from those, the ones that you're talking about, and I know exactly which ones they'll be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, um, it's about knowing those triggers, isn't it? And making sure those triggers are actually genuine and, and create, create a, a real sense of, of connection. And um, yeah, I just sort of think that if we if we undertake something that's a more targeted learning experience around the ones that are successful, you get bigger wins all around rather than just something that's generic from top down, it's better to look at the what we've actually got that's working. So yeah, and there are some fantastic um, shops and dare I say, um, in Tilmutu, they're largely run by women, oddly enough. 
Yeah, true. Yeah, that's exactly right what Chris is saying too about that depth of connection. And it's and, and when you're also talking to Susan about that genuine it's not, you know, it's like bird cage when they're holding their big bunches of flowers. And I mean, even me here, I see these big bunches of peonies or whatever it is at the time. And you're you are, you know, whenever you're thinking flowers, naturally my mind is going to there. So um, I mean, I'll, I'll still get things ordered through from her, but it's um it's and then going back to the earlier question about that's how you're always then front and centre. So whenever you're needing whatever that particular item is, or just because you need, so you just need another, another, another shirt that's just a little bit different to the one you bought last week. <laughs> it's um you know it's 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 always front and centre. But it's also too. For, I mean, for our experience when we were first up into our motor a few years ago, it was when we drove down the street really early in the morning, and it's what that store actually physically looked like when everything else was dark. And there were just some fairy lights that were in that window. I mean, I know that there's there's a lot of stores like that now that all sell really beautiful things, but it's also just being, you know, what, what does it look like when when lights are out and you might not be at home on a tablet or a computer, but you've driven down that street after a meal, or it's just all those little touch points. It was actually that in the dark that made me want to go back and see that see that store. And you know, there's still a, you know, I still spend there now from a different city. So it's just all those. How do you really get into like you say that that mindset? Lou, you had your hand up for a question. Yeah, quickly, uh, Chris. Firstly, I want to thank you both for a great, a great presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. What I really want to say to you is that the hospitality industry has a huge role to play here, and I'm involved in that a little bit. And I find it very, very difficult at the moment because we've been absolutely isolated for the last you know, six weeks, seven weeks, and it's going to be hard to get our customers back. But the hospitality promotion of that. I think it's got to be an integral part of what we do in promoting our town. Because if you have that industry operating well, the rest of the town operates well. And I think that those little barriers that we've got, like the COVID uh, passports, are going to cost us a lot of money. I'm emphasised that please, please you promote what you're doing there with the government because I can see so many problems with that, particularly with the smaller uh, hospitality outlets. And we do need something along that line to protect ourselves because you have to have a, what we call a COVID Nazi or something standing at the door saying whether you can come in or not. Uh, but look, honestly, thank you very much for your presentation. And as I say, I do promote that fact that the hospitality industry has an integral part to play. Thanks, Lou. Uh, I still remember Thirsty Thursdays in Te Awamutu. I think we had a few of those in Cambridge. <laughs> Steve, um, if there's no more questions, do you want to just sort of wrap up? And um, we've had a wonderful session. Yeah, I think um, I think there's not much more to say. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll put this um, present with this presentation will go on the YouTube channel for others to see. We might we might do a gentle edit of it to to um, cut the volume down, um, but. Hopefully it'll inform a kind of further discussion around some of the other um, plans and in play and initiatives that, that are going on. Um, so, so thank you very much, Lorraine and Chris. Yep. Sorry that you guys couldn't come up, but um, we're, we're just emerging from our cocoon. So, All the best. Um,